Okay, well, hello everybody. I'm happy to be here with you all today. My name is Sheila Veladinejad. I'm the moderator for this panel, um, representing women in AI and robotics. And I'm gonna do things a little bit differently today when I introduce our guests and panel panelists. Um, I'm gonna mention their titles and share a fun fact about them. And what I'm hoping is that people will uh, give us a clap after each introduction. Um, and the louder the clap, you know, the better that I know that you liked their fun fact. So <laughs> starting with um, uh, myself, <laughs> I'm Sheila uh, Baladinejad, uh, uh, founder of uh, uh, Women in AI and Robotics, and also uh, I have my own consultancy firm, uh, Volcanida Tech. Um, and uh, a fun fact about me is that um, uh, a few years ago, I met the Canadian astronaut uh, Chris Hadfield back in Seattle when he was on a book tour, and he gave a really nice uh, speech and uh, talked to my daughter, um, had a one-on-one -on -one discussion with her, which inspired her to get into aerospace engineering, and she's starting her studies this fall. So that's uh, my fun fact. <laughs> um, and now we clap. <laughs> Next, we have um, Wilfried Eberhardt. He's the Chief Marketing Officer at KUKA. And a fun fact about him is that he's a big fan of Formula One. He has been to many of their races all over the world, and he likes to use the race car lingo at the office with the team. <laughs> then we have uh, Adna Bleek. She is the a uh, doctoral researcher at FAU Erlanger Nuremberg and a Women in AI and Robotics member. A fun fact about Adna is that she has lived in four countries but not left Europe. <laughs> <clears throat> Next we have Daniel Leitner. He is a robotics and AI scientist at the Institute of Robotics and Mechatronics of the DLR. A fun fact about Daniel is that his second son was born on the same night of a space robotics experiment from the uh, ISS, and therefore his son's second name is Alexander, as in Alexander Gerst. And no, he did not miss the birth of his child. <laughs> <laughs> Only <just. laughs> uh, Next we have Lioba Suchenwirt. Uh, she's the Press and Public Relations of uh, Institute of uh, Robotics and Mechatronics of DLR and Vice President of Women in AI and Robotics. Um, fun fact about Lioba is that she spent a year in Mexico as a freelance journalist and she got to swim with a crocodile accidentally. <laughs> Additionally, she can uh, juggle fire, so I'd really like to see that, Lioba. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, next we have uh, Dr. Katharina Hertzkorn. She is a robotics engineer at Neatleaf um, and also a woman in AI robotics member. And a fun fact about her is that she doesn't like chocolate and walked from Munich to Venice. I would really like to hear more about that story. <laughs> Okay. Okay. And then, as far as the structure of the of the talk goes, we'll uh, start with some questions uh, from the panelists, and um, uh, then we'll have some time where I would like the panelists to ask each other questions if they may have any, and then we'll turn to the audience uh, and you know get your questions as well. So let's start with what does diversity mean to you and what got you excited and motivated to get into this topic? Roll up your sleeves and let's start doing something about it. So let's start with Wilfred. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you for the invitation that you know, me as an old white man are part of diversity. That's for me on both sides. And you know, um, I said already in, 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 in the beginning, when we talked about that topic, diversity starts for me in the families, starts with the child, and uh, where we bring them in certain directions. And then later on, it's in the kindergarten, in school, and then in, in, in the jobs. And I think it's still difficult. Uh, we have not the degree we could expect uh, 
to have diversity regarding women, but it's not only women, it's also diversity uh, in other aspects, also people of other countries working together. And, you know, I'm since a long time in robotics. I started my first robotic experiences in 1980 as a young student at the University of Stuttgart at the EPA. Professor Wannecke and Professor Schraft, some of you, the maybe older one, or know the history, know these guys. And here I came from the city of Ulm. It was very stable and very normal and, you know, and uh, not so maybe diverse at this time. And I, I watched already at university much more diversity. Mm -hmm. And later on in the jobs, I worked also for a couple of years in the U.S. I saw in the U.S. much more women mm -hmm. in top positions. I was also at Chrysler at this time, Daimler Chrysler. And one of my counterparts in robotics was a lady. She was a buyer, a, a top purchase manager. And uh, I saw, okay, it works. And you know, I saw there are different aspects. I think that's the thing. To, to view on subjects from different perspectives. If you are only in one direction, you see you get one response. Mm -hmm. And if all guys have the same perspective, you, you, you get the reflection, you're right in this direction, but maybe you're wrong. And we, when you have a diverse perspective from different angles and different perspectives, you get a more 30 degree uh, picture back and feedback and that brings completely new ideas and completely new, new views. Mm -hmm. And now after 30 years more than at KUKA, I can confirm it 100%. You know, we have uh, as head of R&D, a head of our ROX program, which is, uh, you know, a completely new operating system for robots. You can see in the next building, it's called IQCA uh, with the new cobots, with the EASY. It's, it's done with her team and she is leading the R&D team. And she's leading differently, I think, if it would be only, only a man. So the teams are diverse, and why not giving the leadership also to a lady? Mm -hmm. I say that as an older man, you know? Not old, but older. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Wilfred. Thank you. Um, at the, as uh, someone who is, uh, has a master's in artificial intelligence, has um, uh, majored in robotics and working on your doctoral degree, what are your interests in diversity, especially as it relates to AI and robotics? Well, so for me, I think it all starts already so all the time during my master, there are around a lot of women. So from the 100 people that started, I think there were 10 women in my bachelor's and that was the same like, all the time. And um, I think this diversity uh, aspect you can uh, see in the everyday work that we do um, at the university. So for example, we have a, a glove for virtual reality, which I think worked fine for the other people at my chair, which um, are mainly male. Mm -hmm. um, but for me, the glove was just too big. So I think this is already part of diversity where we can see that people are different. It's, it starts small with gloves that don't fit. And then I think it goes further with a lot of different aspects uh, that we can also see when um, we look into the interaction with robots. So I'm working a lot in the interaction part. And um, I think there you can see differences, not only in gender, but also cultural differences. And all of these differences can be better studied if we have diverse teams, because yeah. then we see the differences already during yeah. the research. So you see as your input different from your male colleagues into the innovation that is taking place? Um, yes, for me, what I see as my input is really just giving them a different perspective, point of view. And, mm -hmm. But also, I think what's important for uh, me as a woman now in this position is to show uh, students that they are women in the position mm -hmm. and to show them that it is possible to go further in this road. Yes, definitely. What, you, know, you can't be what you can't see, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I had didn't see a lot of women yeah. in most of my teachers were male, so then it's really important, I think, to see the diversity there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you, Edna. Um, Daniel, 
So you are quite active and an advocate for um, equality in technology. You have, you know, wear many hats. You are engaged with the IEEE um, and um, also with the Association of Women in AI and Robotics. You have mentored many women. How come you became so passionate about introducing women in these fields and what benefit have you seen by doing that? Yeah, that's true. So, um, yes, I'm part of this uh, this organization and I'm also part of the chair, like I'm a chairperson of Women in Engineering of IEEE Robotics and Automation Society. But that came after actually not too long time. Like I basically rocket started actually in this topic kind of. Um, because diversity to me is equal to creativity. So if you if you cannot think differently, if you cannot think diverse, if you do not have a team that thinks diverse, you will always face the same problems and never go around them. So, um, and that's very crucial. And the process of diversity, for me, is really, really crucial that it also, or actually, to a good, quite some extent, involves men, because if men do not see that uh, creativity comes with diversity and vice versa, th th we will basically um, be behind our expectations, right? And all of that started a few years ago when I um, was finishing my PhD thesis and I started to have more master thesis students. and. It turns out that, that some of them, in, in the very beginning, um, right away, two of them were female. And I didn't even recognize that there was a difference, right? For me, it was like students. They do their work, and, and it's fine in the end. But, but then I realized, um, especially when I had the second student, which was trying to call me on my phone, and I was not there, I was, and she was reluctant in calling all the time. And I was like, oh, man, who can be so annoying? And then I picked it up once I was there, and uh, that moment I was recognizing that it was one of my future female students then. And then I looked back and was like, oh, is that now unfair that I was basically now treating her like that? Or is that, what, what was that something? And that sparked something in me that I was thinking about a lot. Yeah, and then one thing came to another, and I had a junior research group that was actually obliged by our um, former board, head of the board, to have 50% female researchers in it, and my team already had that, so I applied for it, and all of a sudden, which was considered a weakness at the beginning, was a strength for me, and since then I was basically pursuing and pursuing in that direction. Very good, thank you for sharing that, Daniel. And uh, Lioba, in your role as uh, being part of the uh, press and PR of uh, Institute of Robotics and Mechatronics, you have initiated many networking opportunities for women. You uh, do this on an annual basis for the Women AI and Robotics. You've seen the rewards of that firsthand and what has motivated you to get into this topic and you know, how has it benefited the uh, team at, uh, you know, at the DLR? Yeah, um, God, am I really that loud? Okay, um, sorry. Um, I think the, the main message that I, I try to bring across, or the main message that I, I keep on learning, actually, is that diversity is strength. I mean, that's something that I, that I wanted to, when I started uh, introducing this female networking events or this female-oriented events, uh, just after I started um, at, uh, at the DLR, was uh, to come along not as some sort of, you know, victim, as some sort of begging person needing some support, but actually showing strengths. Because I think that's what diversity is. Diversity is strengths. And I think Daniel, and I really agree with Daniel um, in regards to the creativity part, um, in regards to the problem-solving part. Um, you need a lot of creativity, obviously, to solve problems. Um, and the more diverse people think, the more diverse we have the resources, the, the, the more diverse we can actually solve problems. But I think there's also one more element. I think there's the element of recognizing that there actually is a problem. 
you know, and you cannot solve problems um, until you recognize that there is a problem. And I think in order to recognize sometimes that there is a problem, we need diversity. Mm -hmm. I think we're all now familiar, or a lot of us are familiar with the, with the face recognition software um, with Apple, which had major difficulties recognizing people of a darker color. You know, um, and that's not a stable software. I mean, that's not a great software if it doesn't recognize 50% or even more of the world population. You can't say that's a big success, right? Uh, it only works 50% of the time. I mean, for everything else, that would be a failure, you know? And yet, Apple went ahead and thought, this is a great thing, this is a great product, it's something that we're proud of, um, etc. And it took a black student at MIT saying, hold on, it never works for me, you know? Why does it work for my colleagues? Why does it work for my fellow students? But it never works for me. Um, so I think, yes, creativity, problem solving, but also recognizing problems. Um, <laughs> And I think that's the only way to get better, really, to, to solve yes. problems. And that's because um, you asked about the networking events. When I started, <coughs> and I'm relatively new, uh, I, I went to my boss and I said, look, I've got an idea. You know, We want to get more people in. We want to have something special. We want to show. Um, I see myself um, not as a marketing person as such, but really as a science communicator, as a science translator sometimes, You know, trying to translate um, the things that um, my colleagues develop into society, because um, I think that's the key um, to accepting technology, to implementing technology, is, is acceptance and is um, being, f and first of all, you need to know about it, right? You need to understand what's going on there. Um, so I very much propose this as a networking event, and uh, there wasn't that much female oriented stuff before at the Institute, um, but my boss was really open and he said, like, okay, well, let's try it. Let's try it. Um, and we chose a rainy November afternoon on purpose, and because I have to admit, I was nervous too, because to in my mind, this was a great idea, you know, we were going to get all these people, and our colleagues were going to show their stuff, but you know what, if nobody turns up, <laughs> and it's just me, you know, and a bunch of beautiful uh, hors d'oeuvre, um, but it wasn't like that at all. Um, we had 100 people on a rainy after uh, November afternoon coming to the institute, uh, looking at stuff, we had companies there that, that were really, int uh, like really interesting for us. Um, we are still in touch with some of the people, um, and the colleagues too. Uh, I noticed that sometimes pe people are like that, they don't really know yet what diversity is or how to behave or what, what does that mean, what do I have to do, you know? But they're, they're open in principle, I noticed. Like people are really open in principle uh, once, you, once you show them the door. Um, you know, once you show them the opening. And now we have, I mean, and now as we, as we said, it's an established event. At least once a year we do something female-centric. Uh, we do something, obviously, as, uh, with women in AI and robotics. But we also have other female events. We participate in Girls' Day. We participate in a lot of uh, different stuff. And it's become the norm, and it's become a positive thing. Mm -hmm. It's not from a position of weakness. Yep. It's something adding strength. Yep. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much, Leova. <laughs> and Katharina. I think um, I have to, you know, speak from experience that finding you in, an, in our network, well, you know, uh, we, we, I was personally overjoyed because there are not that many women roboticists out here, um, especially in this region. We searched, <laughs> and uh, we, we were very happy to, to, you know, cross paths. And um, tell us a little bit about your experience as a robotics engineer. Um, and, you know, what motivated you and also what were the hurdles that you encountered and how do you suggest that those hurdles be uh, removed and, you know, uh, what can we do about them? So for me, it was similar to Adna. Um, I was, I don't want to say alone, but, well, there are not so many women out in the field for me especially when I studied. And when I studied, this kind of felt like something special, right? So it's also flattering because you're like the only woman in a room full of men. Um, so back in the days, I still thought, well, it's kind of fun being the one person. Um, but then I realized that this actually, or the push to more diversity led to more women and to more people um, of other backgrounds, join companies and also join research groups. Um, but the point then only starts because then it's starting to get exhausting for many people because then people have different opinions and then they need to fight. And then especially if you're working in a company uh, where things should be efficient, 
people try to uh, minimize the time that it takes until coming to a decision, right? And then this other voice sometimes is not willingly heard, I want to say, right? Because, not because I'm a woman, but just because the point of view is different. Um, so actually, diversity for me means also working together with people of different backgrounds, but especially hearing all the opinions. And um, this can be an exhausting process, and that's what I always want to say, that even if you hire women, and even if you promote them to be one team lead out of 10, then this is only like a small drop. And we need to reach the point where this is actually normal, that all people in the room raise their voice. All people, like not depending on a woman or not. Um, and we can have these discussions, either um, about culture or about whatever product you want to build, um, openly. And um, so this is where I became very interested in diversity, because I see that in many teams in general, I think it's independent of research or larger companies, um, the willingness to hear different voices um, can still be improved. Let's say it like that. Yes. Yeah, thank you. So talking about uh, uh, diversity in the team, uh, you reminded me of, you know, um, I had a, a job in Denmark, worked there for a, a while, and it was the first time that I experienced that it was a flat or organization. Everybody had a voice. And I was a consultant, but even the consultant had a voice. We, I was invited to all their um, meetings. I was part of the decision making, and everyone in the room, on the team was included. And I think this goes back to the culture in companies. And we are seeing some changes, perhaps the changes are happening from the top and is not trickling down to the bottom yet. Um, but I think we should also see changes. Sometimes it needs to come from the bottom and go away all the way up, right? So um, uh, Wilfred, as someone who works at a large company and you have a large staff and, and so on. What are some initiatives that KUKA is taking to diversify the teams and um, bring on more people so you can build solutions that are going to be benefiting people with different needs and so on? You know, you know one, one thing I want to fully confirm what you said, it's not only be, uh, because of women or men, it's really about all aspects of nationalities. Mm -hmm. uh, I can talk about having experience with China heavily. You know, as you might know, KUKA has uh, a big, big shareholder from China, Medea. And uh, so my, my, my second impression was in China, hey, they are totally different, but we can learn from them. And you know, this was not somehow planned. It came through the acquisition which for sure you can discuss on diff different aspects critically, but on one hand, we learned as a German-based typical machine company with robots and so, but still in the behavior a German machine company, uh, as many in VDMA, not against VDMA companies, but you know, more traditional, conservative, sitting in Augsburg, Bavaria, you know, uh, coming to, to China, to Shanghai, uh, to, to, to uh, Foshan, uh, and here you have completely different people with different education, uh, a different business background. You know, Medea makes more B2C, we make B2B, and to say, hey, listen, learn, what are they do differently and why? And, uh, you know, one thing we learned quickly without an initiative, you know, coming somewhere, you know, that's the initiative from the boss. We saw by, 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 by looking what they're doing, you know, in the city, in the company, in the factories, wow, they are not perfect, but they are quick. So speed, <laughs> speed of ex uh, uh, execution. And, you know, discussing a lot in the beginning, <coughs> discussing a lot, listening to everybody. By the way, that's what we learned at KUKA too. Don't listen only to the loud ones, which is very often, you know, like in the media, when you're loud, 
then they listen to you when you raise your voice. No, you have to listen to the, to the quiet ones and to enable them to, sell, to tell something. So when you all bring that together, then you can see that when you have uh, the possibility of different nations and different backgrounds, even business backgrounds, uh, it makes sense to have more of it. You know, and one result we, as an initiative, was maybe that uh, Peter Monen, our CEO since 2018, gave an opportunity to an existing, uh, very skilled woman, uh, maybe some of you know her, Christina Wagner. Uh, she is the head of R&D and the, uh, the new software program Rocks, or <laughs> our name to the market, uh, IQ Car, which is a new operating system for cobots, easy to use. You can see, by the way, in the next building, the result uh, of it. It's led by a lady. And what's different? The difference is that uh, she has a different approach to bring teams together, mm -hmm. to, to let them work. Mm -hmm. may, may I some say something to that? Okay. Um, the different approach of women, I would state it doesn't exist. And I think it doesn't exist because we're all humans, right? So every human and every character has a different type of leading and a different type of seeing the world. And the main question for me is how do you foster, also as a larger company or a smaller company, um, that all these voices are heard and also um, made visible, right? And it's not enough to have one. And it's also not enough to have two, I would say. Um, and I'm saying this so strongly, sorry, sorry about that, um, because I'm getting these special women questions, I would say, like, ah, do you lead more in an emotional way or I, I don't know. And um, these are questions that my male colleagues are never asked. And also the way how we state or how we um, actually tell the work of others is different for women and for men. And I think we all need to be very um, sensitive of <coughs> how we talk about the work of others. And actually, I believe that the gender, in this case, like, is not really important, right? Because she's a person, obviously she's very skilled, obviously, because otherwise uh, the product would have failed. Um, which might have nothing to do with her gender. And it's important to me because the, the telling, the questions, and also the um, way, also how my work is um, perceived is different than for Daniel, let's say. And we did both research at DLR, and I would say even back then, the stories that were told were different. And that is not fostering different voices in anywhere. That's what I tried to say. Can I answer? Sure, go ahead. I think this is a nice uh, lively that's, discussion. That's, <laughs> I think uh, that's right, what you, what, you, what you say. But on one point, you have to make a starting point, And it's a message. When you're in a big corporation, it's not perfect. But of if the not. boss, like Peter Monen, enables a person to do something which was not the case before, and it's a woman, okay, you have to, to say it. Yeah? Uh, it could be a man with very good skills, but it's a woman with very good skills. It's, not, uh, it's, no, it's in big organizations, sorry. It's, it's the reality, sorry, the reality is it's special. Yep. You don't have in Germany, all over the time, everywhere in R&D, management positions, women. So, sorry, it, it's special. I have to say a little bit different. Yep. You can say, I don't like it, that's fine. But the situation is that this is different. You know, and, and this gives, it's a signal, it's a message to the other ones. That's the good thing. And it has to be, because it's not standard, you're right, it's not good, but it is as it is, then the top management has to give a sign, a message to enable it. I and agree. then people should watch it. So the lady has to do the job that people say she's, a good jo she's doing a good job. That's not the, the management job. And that is a signal that other ones to get 
the chance. That's my opinion. Um, I, I think mm. what we're trying to get at here with this discussion and dialogue <laughs> is that we need more Christinas, we need more women empowered, um, and we cannot do this alone. As a nonprofit charity organization, we have been working towards helping other women get their voice, empowering them, <clears throat> reaching out to companies to collaborate with them, um, and uh, getting support and so on. But I think what we're trying to get to is there is some social corporate responsibility in addition to individual responsibility, in addition to uh, responsibility of the governments, we need to all, you know, put our hands together, hand in hand, and make change faster and accelerate it, because women are the primary people who are affected by war, by climate change, by everything, and it's still happening in 2022. So, if we want to make a change, the onus is not on the woman to go get better education, to go find better opportunities. The onus is on everybody because everybody's life could be better if there is diversity, if women are empowered, if their solutions are incorporated into you know, uh, innovation that is being built and so on. And um, Lioba, I think you, you had some comments. I had some similar, yeah. yeah. Um, I was going to say that I think you both can agree that there is a special filter being put upon women. Women are being viewed differently. Um, so uh, Christina Wagner can't just be in charge of, um, of a department, in charge of development, but she's also being viewed with a different filter. She's being judged differently. Um, in her performance, then would be a colleague, uh, a male colleague, who's one out of you know out of a hundred uh, <laughs> box standard <laughs> um, a male um, uh, computer roboticists and uh, roboticists rather uh, or computer developers or whatever. Um, and I, but I, I do agree um, with um, Katarina that we, that there is um, the question of if this is this filter helpful or not. Um, to encourage more people, is this filter helpful um, to 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 normalize something that we very much have to normalize, really, because it's part of society, you know, um, whether we like it or not. Um, you know, 50% of the world's population are women, you know, uh, and it's an incredible waste not to use these resources, as you say, they're um, affected negatively, but they could contribute positively. Um, and in the end of the day, you know, um, <laughs> women are here and we should use them. And, and we want to profit from the product as well. You know, women aren't just people who, who, who develop products um, or who contribute to development, but they're the future consumers and their future customers and the future clients. And we know that technology has to be implemented in society. Um, and when you just when you just look around at these products, I mean, they're going to be used by women as well. <laughs> so let's just let's just normalize something that really is already normal, and we're sort of actually we're almost undenormalizing something that is already normal. Okay. Um, we know that. Um, First computer programmers or first programmers were women. You know, they were the, the people who, who connected people on the telephones, and then people became programmers. Uh, women became programmers, and then you had these handy, smart, nice, smaller computers, personal computers, and all of a sudden it became more appealing to men. All of a sudden, you know, the Bill Gates um, teenagers sat in their basements and started doing it, and all of a sudden it didn't become natural for women anymore. Right. Um, so let's stop denormalizing women being part in this, and let's right. let's take away this filter. Um, right. Right. So uh, as a consultant myself, working with investors, I kind of encourage them to get into impactful investment and put their money into you know, doing something good and social good and, and so on. And um, I think, and, and what I you know, try to motivate them with is at the end of the day, this will be good for your pocket too, because I think corporations are money driven. This is a fact, um, and so perhaps having the realization that when you have, for example, you know, someone who is um, having a different perspective, um, I'll give you an example. 
uh, one of the, our, our members on our team, uh, she's a, a professor at the University of Waterloo in Canada, and she was saying that she was working with um, her colleagues and they were uh, working on a, a robot to you know, provide home services and, and, and whatnot. And the discussion that was happening was around, okay, you know, the robot needs to serve uh, whoever orders it some uh, drinks, right? And, and they were heavily engaged in that discussion. And, and then she thought, okay, but what if my eight-year-old asks for a beer? Would the robot give her the beer? And nobody had even thought about that. So this is an example of where, like, you know, a female in, in the crowd could, you know, bring that perspective of, have we looked at this case of uh, what if an eight-year-old asks for alcohol, you know? And now I, I think, Daniel, you being, you know, in innovation and seeing firsthand, can you share some of your experiences where, you know, this has actually been helpful and impactful in innovation? So, uh, first of all, I think I would like to add what we had before to the discussion, um, just as a small remark, because I think what you all said is on both sides true, but I think it needs to, uh, the, 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 there needs to be a shift in perspective of society, because it should not be that people look at the women and say, oh, that's special. People should rather look at a chair or board and see if there's no woman, then, then they should say that is special. Yes. So it's basically the other way around. And it should not be the women that actually make that observation, but also men, black, people of color, mm -hmm. white, all of them. So this is the other way around, my mm -hmm. opinion. Right, and um, with, respect to, with respect to innovation, so I guess some personal some personal experience that I had um, so there's twofold things because um, you, if you also think about acceptance of robots of robotics and AI um, you, you may actually want to think that okay um, in AI we have a lot of female voices why should not we have a male one and vice versa in robotics we have a lot of male like robots why shouldn't we have a female one but then, if, if you go into discussion with um, female researchers about this topic, they are actually not too keen about it. Like, um, so they, they don't like either, maybe. Maybe they like it the one way, maybe they like it the other way. And then there is tendencies. So um, a, 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 a man would probably say, oh, as long as the robot makes a good performance, it doesn't make a difference if, it looks like, if it's like shaped like a woman. But then if you go to women, and then they say, no, it's not, because basically you are re reducing the capability of the system to its form, to its female form. And this is not what matters, it's about the action. And so it's, it's very difficult, and, and you get these insights for having uh, robots accepted by society if you have diverse teams, but you will not get them if you have only one sort of people, like only white European male, mm -hmm. that you will not face that overall problem. Right, yeah. I would like to challenge, or I would like to ask you about the um, robots being predominantly male because they do not have actually, uh, like the robots that I've seen haven't got male genitals. In fact, they're rather gender neutral, I think. Um, I, I don't know, I'm not most familiar with all of them, but so they're kind of gender neutral, um, except that they don't have breasts. Um, so what makes you think that they're male? Is it the name or is it? Uh, names is a good thing, yeah. So just go through our booth. It's actually not a good yeah. example. There's Justin, there's David, there's Miro. <laughs> um, and they are all personated, like David and Justin are the basically the, the flagship robots. And then there's Sarah, which is basically only an arm. Judgeable if that is a good decision or not. Um, or it's a decision <laughs> for sure. Um, but. Yeah, it's not so easy to say, actually. That's but because what I'm trying to get at is, why do we see a default human body without any genitals whatsoever as male? Why is that a male, male body? I mean, that could be just, I mean, that could be just nothing. It could be just human. It could be female without any breasts or long hair. I mean, but I think a lot of women have short hair. A lot of men have long hair. So why do we automatically presume that Justin, I mean, Roland Justin has a, you know, has a male name, okay, but there's Justine also as a female name. So why is it a he? 
I'm just, I'm just wondering. Yeah, maybe it's also because of how we are educated. If you look into science fiction, I was just trying to figure out where is there a female robot in the, like in the past. In the nowadays movies, they, they are there. Mm. But if you look back, there's C-3PO, there's Data, and there, okay, 3PO, I don't know. But Data, obviously. R2-D2. <laughs> I don't <laughs> know. Anything? But then if you also go to like to all this, this <laughs> but, but there's a female Terminator. There is, um, yeah, later what's on there the, was uh, Ava in... in mm -hmm. Yeah, also later on. Yeah, um, so... Yeah, that it changed. But, but actually you're true, or like, I think now like, when they are female, when they're clearly female, their, their female role has something to do with the film. So Ava needs to be female in order to kind of seduce yeah. the programmer, right? Um, so maybe... I Where else others can be neutral, yeah. which is something with what we said before, it's, it's supposed to be normal to be male. So you see a robot, like the robot from iRobot, that's not a male robot to me, that's just a figurine, that's just a stick. So I, I think, uh, Leoba, what you're getting at is the unconscious bias. Yes, that absolutely. We are pre-programmed, all of us, we are predispositioned to see certain things as male or female, and, and that is part of it which comes back to the um, uh, point of changing mindsets. Um, it needs to happen in our homes. It needs to happen at companies. That women can be you know, in a position of power. They can be in a position of a scientist. They can be doing uh, uh, programming robots and, and so on. And changing the mindset is something that we all need to work on to make it happen. I'll give you an example that one of our team members came to me one day and she said she has an engineering degree from Karlsruhe Institute of Technology and at work her uh, teammates had a meeting set up and she was not invited because they thought she wouldn't understand it was too technical for her. <laughs> so, you know, these are the mindsets that we encounter and struggle with and need to... Um, uh, you know, overcome that by having these types of discussions, having these dialogues, inviting women to these types of events. Uh, you know, walking around here a couple of days ago, I, I don't see that many of us. I'm hoping that, um, I'm grateful that Automatica VDMA, uh, you know, organized uh, for us to be here. But I think, you know, next time around, I'm hoping that we can gather more of uh, women in, in robotics to come benefit from the networking, benefit from being inspired and in seeing technology um, out here and um, helping to change the default of automatically presuming that a roboticist is a man. So that, that, that's the point, and I think we're getting close to the end, and I was hoping that we will have some time for um, Q&A, but before we wrap things up, I think that, um, you know, we are 60 to 100 years away from equality according to the World Economic Forum, um, and we need to join forces. I cannot emphasize this strong enough that um, everybody, every individual, we need to work alongside with men and not against them in order to make this change happen. And we call people to action. Everyone can take small little action. Next time, if you're, you know, you're having a team meeting, uh, make sure that the woman on the team is also invited. Next time, if you wanna have a team uh, discussion and you wanna go out for a beer, maybe the women who are still primary caregivers would prefer to go home to their families and they will miss out on all those important discussions that you're gonna have over a beer. So keep that in mind when you have those types of events. There are small little things that everybody can do and um, at Women in AI and Robotics, we're working with the industry and hopefully with the governments as well to make a change and we're seeing extremely great results this weekend, we have a robotics hackathon that is organized by our team in Bremen. 43 women in Germany signed up for this hackathon. I'm very proud and pleased by that, but I'm also thinking, why aren't they here? You know, <laughs> we should facilitate that and you know, um, encourage them to, to come to these. So, and this is where the industry comes into the picture. We need their support. We are 
um, I, I was looking at our page on LinkedIn. It's a, uh, you know, we chose think tanks. There was no category for do tanks. We, we are a do tank, we, we are doers, and we're making some changes, but we cannot do it alone. We need academia, we need governments, we need corporations, and we are seeing positive things happen, and hopefully there will be more of that uh, coming up soon. So thank you everyone for the lively uh, discussion. I think we had some really good exchanges of opinions, diverse opinions, which is really great, and as <laughs> Wilfred pointed out, diversity doesn't necessarily mean gender. It could mean you know, people with different abilities, people from different um, uh, ethnicities. Different age. <laughs> different age, definitely. <laughs> yeah. And, and so <clears throat> let's make sure everybody is, is included and feels that they're part of the solution. Um, so uh, with that, let's see if we have um, some questions from the audience. and. I'm hoping there's a question. Yes? Would you? I was wondering if someone of you can tell us how is Germany and Europe doing in terms of inclusion and diversity comparing to other regions? Maybe you have to say you have some experience in China and the others that live in other countries can tell us like, how are we progressing? You, you got a mic? I have a microphone, <laughs> I have a microphone. No, I cannot say you, I'm not the expert to say what the German government is doing. I can only observe what I see. So I saw first time in US more women in, 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 in management positions, not only in R&D, you know, it's, we also should be not too in a certain direction. We have other jobs which are important too. We have purchase, you have sales, you have production, yeah? why not? A supply chain management. I saw that in US and then in China exactly the same. So somehow there is a difference obviously to Europe, to Germany. And I think, I think Germany is, is, no, is not yet on the top, it's far away. But on the other hand, I have to observe that we have the German former chancellor was a lady, Angela Merkel, I think was also unique for such a long time. Now in the new government, uh, we have again a lady as foreign minister, um, Annalena Baerbock. I think there are examples. It needs time and it needs constant pressure, uh, not only from women, also from the men to say, I support that, from both sides, from the older ones, from the younger ones, from the whole society. And I think finally, if the society is pushing it, it will push a new policy, a new government, and you know that it's going through and then changes. Talking about policy and government, so uh, Wilfred, you act as a liaison for, with, with the E United Robotics, yes. um, and, and you are on the board and you act as a liaison between the industry and the government. So are you noticing any changes, dialogue on this topic and any kind of action from the governments to say, okay, let's do something about it. Let's make, you know, being diverse will help with innovation. It will make Germany more competitive. And, you know, and that is needed. Um, Germany is great in the automobile industry, but sometimes, you know, in other industries like software where you need to take chances, you need to take some risks, you need to just do it. Perhaps we're lagging there a little yes. bit. Yes. And are there some dialogues with the government agencies that you have encountered? Let's diversify to, to make things better and be more competitive. To be honest, it's far away from enough. It's very low. It's still, if I, if I go to the VDMA meetings and United meetings in Brussels or in Frankfurt or somewhere else or in Berlin, it's fully man dominated. You know, the first step is, you know, put the tie away, <laughs> still have a suit, sorry, yeah? So we are still in, in some roles. And uh, I remember when I was in the, uh, um, since a couple of years, in the inner circle of the VDMA, and I came without tie, I was, the, I was the only guy. The second time, five guys. Third time, half. And now maybe two, three, they want to keep it. Mm. 
or uh, when was the reception on Tuesday at the uh, uh, nice building in the city? What's the name of the government? Uh, I don't know the English name. Resident. Residence, thank you. Mm. Where Mr. Markus Blume, uh, the Bavarian Minister uh, for um, uh, Development and, and, and Arts, uh, came, I saw it, with two open, you know, and no tie. And then he said to everybody, maybe you might go to, to smart casual, you know. <laughs> and then you could observe that some people, they said, wonderful, now I can put the tie away. I have more air to breathe, I feel better, and the others, they keep it. But it's okay if they keep it. Yeah. But it's, 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 you know, it's still conservative, it's still, on the other hand, on the table we have had Professor, maybe I spell it wrong, Buix, the head of the German Ethic Council. Uh, he also uh, was very visible on TV regarding Corona mm -hmm. and so on in the last months in Germany. And, you know, she it's already, you can see, but it's not. I think Germany is not in front, and exactly what you said regarding completely new approaches, not to improve things like cars, like machines, make little improvements, little improvements. Um, that's okay, but maybe not enough, and we are right now in a big transition period with all the crisis. You know, the crisis are reflecting a change, mm -hmm. and that's the opportunity maybe to push it even more, to make changes, and that uh, they'd say the, the old style is not anymore popular. Mm -hmm. And to be honest, I watch here on this fair compared to 2018, or especially when I try to remember 2004, the first one, a big, big change. Mm -hmm. I mean, you really try to look back for yeah. 10 years then you see a big change, and it's, I think that's a society. Yeah, definitely. There, there, and there so we have to do more, but uh, by a lot of stakeholders. Mm -hmm. We are too small. Yeah. Doesn't mean we shouldn't do it. Right. Yeah? But everybody so should do it. What I see is missing is somebody needs to stitch it all together and bring everybody together, and that's what's missing. Yeah. Um, but with this question, I think I'm very interested to ask Edna, because she has recently been in the academic world and she has you know, studied uh, artificial intelligence and robotics. I'm curious to know how many women were in your uh, cohort? Um, yes, as I said, during my bachelor's, I think there were like 10 out of 100 when we started. And during my master's, even less, so it's, not easy to say because we didn't have all courses together, but um, I think I knew all the women, and it's for sure weren't more than ten, probably more around five to ten. It's so not a lot, and, and there were a lot more guys than women for sure. Okay. So, um, some final words, I think. Oh, do, did you, think did you have a, a... No, no, I just agreed. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I speak I some final words, words but... <laughs> yeah. so, so, it's just, uh, I think we already took some questions as well. We're coming towards the end. And um, the final words that I usually um, have at, you know, when I give a talk or a panel and whatnot, that um, let us open doors and keep them open so others may pass through it. So with that, um, thank you very much for having us here today. Thank you, Wilfrid. Thank you, Adna. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Lioba. And thank you, Katharina, for being here with us and sharing your perspectives. And I'm hoping that we can hear from people in the audience here today and um, others who may have heard um, our panel to, to join forces with us. Next hackathon, I'm hoping that we'll have more uh, cooperation with other companies as well. Thank you.